Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a while. This is Julian Mason from Adrenaline Combatives, and I'm here with Mr. Daz Norton from Fendo UK. How are you doing, brother? I'm all right, mate. How are you? Nice. Yeah, yeah. You're Finally, good. have a bit of time to myself. You know, we've I've not done anything like that for quite a while. I used to do one or two podcasts a week, you know? Yeah. And I've not done one now for like a couple of months, maybe even three months or something, because all I've right. been really busy with work. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I'm glad to uh, finally have a bit of time and uh, do something. So um, tell you what, here is to a good conversation waiting to happen. Do you want to give us a little introduction about who you are, what what you've been into, a little bit your your path, you know, in in two minutes, two three minutes? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, Daz Norton from uh, Fendo UK. Um, I started this Fendo UK through um, the work that I've done previously. So I've worked in uh, frontline security, done door work, um, close protection. Then I sort of worked into working for the police. Um, I've worked there for a number of years in different positions, different departments, um, and then sort of used my own knowledge and my own skills that I've used throughout years of, of working in those certain environments um, and narrowed it down, made it into Fendo UK. So we deal with self-protection, self-defence and violence prevention as, as a whole. Mm, okay. So you, 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 you've kind of gathered your years of professional experience from various spheres you know be it's like security or law enforcement uh to do what you are doing now so yeah what what is it that you do now how do you you know how, how do you you said violence prevention i know we you know we, we will work our way to that subject and we'll talk about a lot of really cool stuff today but how, how do you view your work what is it that you do exactly so we run workshops um in violence prevention and self-protection depends on what the subject matter is that people want so we work within the communities um and mainly in birmingham at the moment and we spread out different areas um so we can run anything from uh, workshops to seminars uh, dealing with self-protection or we work in the community looking at violence prevention and the root causes of violence and how to come together as a community to stop that from from happening yeah that's good that you know so i have mentioned there i mean people that follow my work have seen a little bit this this uh this sudden interest in violence prevention which is a very important subject that's not been spoken about enough in the world of protection and as yeah. i was saying to you i've decided to call uh, the bulk of my work is protection um i wouldn't even call it self-protection because like i said to you this narrows it down to the self uh, as yeah. in protection relates to protection self-protection third-party protection protection of properties individuals and you know and you name it so yeah. for example i uh, you know that i do close protection so as part of my work close protection relates to third-party protection or yeah. um you know pr protection of properties or protection of uh, like places you know like yeah. how do you call that um i'm looking for a word in particular like resident residential you know like rst residential security and stuff like yeah, that. yeah yeah so as as now if we if we if we think about this using these words protection and we look at we look at it as an umbrella a big umbrella and we we have a look at what is under this umbrella there is a lot of things there are a lot yeah. of really good things and very important and interesting things that goes under that umbrella and i believe that violence prevention is a, a massive topic that falls yeah, under that huge. umbrella and that mainly relates to prevent things from happening by educating people on violence what violence is how it occurs how it forms in the individual uh, the causes and the um, the effects of it and and how to basically prevent it by like i said by teaching people to uh, see the uh, no violence see the early signs of it and being able to uh, uh, get away from it, mitigate it from the very first 
yep. time it develops. So how would you how would you define violence prevention? So the way we work it is we may work with schools or ex-gang members or people who are being groomed for gangs. And we may do workshops where we look at the root causes, such as why do we carry noise? Why are kids carrying noise nowadays? So you go back to what the government and the police think by by um, making a sentence for carrying a knife even longer, that's going to prevent it from happening where it really doesn't. So you've got to look at why why are these kids carrying knives in the first place? And the yes. number one thing is for self-protection because everybody carries knives. Because one person carries it, another person is going to carry it, and it's just a ripple effect, isn't it? So we look at root causes, so we narrow it right down. Right, we ask the, the people themselves, the people who are doing this, why are you carrying it? Yeah. Is there anything else that we can look at? Is there alternatives? There were a lot of them say because we don't want it, we, we, we're worried about our, self, our own personal self-defence. We don't know how to defend ourselves against someone with a knife. You yeah. know what I mean? So first of all, we need to get to the root cause, look at it, stop that from happening and giving them alternatives rather than carrying a knife. Yeah. So we've got to look at youth violence as a whole, not just to do with carrying knives, but as a whole, look at the root cause. And a lot of the times it can be through being, doing sort of leadership programs. Okay. Uh, you know giving them something extra to do so they might some people like to come to our classes and do self-protection classes and um, some people like to do football giving them a different avenue to go down do you know what i mean yeah. so so some it's working so violence prevention yeah. yeah yeah so violence prevention is working to see the root cause mm -hmm. and offering them different services and different avenues to go down in order to sort of uh, come away from that sort of environment mm okay so it's, it's quite in depth yeah yeah uh so i mean we we've had we've had a few chats about it already and uh, I've, I've seen that it goes really in depth and you know as i said to you my my vision my vision uh as per you know what my work is and what it's going to become and how i'm going to develop it is to have the whole the whole um protection umbrella and talking about pre-event during event and post event which yeah. is really what any self-protection am i anyone that claims to teach protection self-protection third-party protection and all that yeah. needs to speak about those three times instead yeah, of yeah. just talking about one because most people only speak about one time and that is the in-fight confrontation phase which is yeah which is yes it, it it's self defense or it could be something else because yeah. when people call it self defense then defend comes from the word defending defending means that you are reacting to a stimuli you're reacting to something that's already being done to you so yeah. that's what i was saying to you earlier if you're facing an active shooter scenario like what happened in the us not too long ago and you're defending and you got shot already somebody got yeah. shot and now you know you, you, you you're just gonna have to survive the best you can. So this is not the best form of, of protection. This is not the best form of, of self protection. The best form of self protection would be to really emphasize on the pre confrontation phase to see everything that's possible and what we can do and how we can develop good observational skills and uh, you know like good personal awareness, environmental awareness, situational awareness, and behavioral awareness to spot things before they happen and not even be there or, or you know, yeah. physically remove ourselves from the situation before it escalates into something physical. So this, to me, became became passionating because, you know, it's, it, it's stuff that if I want to help somebody and that, that you know, this is where we're getting at, if we aim for the 90% of the population that are not fighters, 
They don't want mm. to learn how to fight. They're not willing to pay to go three to five times a week, put some gloves on and get punched in the face and punching people. It's only people like you and I that that, that like that. And unfortunately, this is only 10% of the population that are into martial arts and into, you know, heavy impact martial arts. You yeah. know? So when you think about this is how do we help the remaining 90% now? And helping the remaining 90% would be just to focus on pre-fight confrontation because you know yourself and I'm sure you will agree with that is that if you have good obs observational skills and good awareness and good understanding of criminal behavior and how violence occurs and how it starts the interview phase the the ambush all that if you know about all that stuff nine times out of ten you won't even need to use this you won't yeah. even need it won't need to escalate the level of force so that's what i find really really interesting about yeah. uh, when it comes to violence prevention is that it violence prevention means completely outbirth violence in the first place and everyone can do that with the proper knowledge and the proper training yeah so, yeah absolutely so, yeah so how do so we how do go about oh, sorry, what what do, what do you think the the most important points to make in in violence prevention what do you think those are in order to help the the bulk of the population the people that are not willing to learn how to fight yeah so 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 yeah like we said violence prevention is looking at the root cause obviously but uh, self-protection is is involves a different sort of uh uh way way towards dealing with violence like you say so yeah. we've got to look at the pre-fight so we've got to look at um awareness and avoidance how to be aware of your surroundings then we've got to look at things like uh, apathy and denial talk about apathy what why do people think that's never going to happen to them and when it does happen to them why do people think well why did that happen to me yeah then we've got to look at belief systems because if you don't truly believe that you're going to survive a situation yeah. then the chances are you're not going to survive that situation that's true yeah then we've got to look at mindset you need to build a combative mindset and we mm -hmm. need to look at fear management, how to how to manage yourself. You know, like this, this I always say there's no such word as fear as such. It's just your natural, your body's natural reaction to a confrontation. Yeah. So how to manage that. Then we have to look at the different types of fears that may come into, into play during the confrontation. So you've got uh, uh, pre-fight uh, fear, then we've got in-fight fear, secondary yeah. assault fear tertiary assault fear and then post assault fear so then we need to look at what happens after the event how to manage how to manage yourself so self triage is the first yeah, thing yeah. then we need to look at how to or what to say if you're confronted by the police mm -hmm. um, actually how to deal with the person that you've dealt with that's another thing you know you've still got that you've still got that responsibility of making sure that per that person's safe Yes. working within the in uk law you know so you've got to look at that then you've got to look at you know if you if you got taken to court so if you're charged with assault which is, can happen a lot of the times yeah a lot of people get put or sentenced not for the actions that they've done but for the words that they're spoken yes so, yes. so you need to have courtroom survival management which i always call it that's and nice. look I at like that. yeah the school 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 survival management yeah yeah that's a good so term. so on on our website there's there's uh loads of different folders so there's everything to do with self-protection and then everything to do with violence prevention so you can sort of make it all together if you want to or mm -hmm. just deal with self-protection so and and I've got, there's loads of of uh um posts that i've put on facebook and instagram as well which can help so yeah there's a lot a lot involved so if we if we kind of give a, a breakdown as i said so the breakdown of protection would be really focusing on those three times yeah. left of bang bang right, and of, right bang. of bang yeah before something happens during the event and after the event uh yeah. past present future but everything yeah. happens in the present yeah but when we look at it there there is a beginning there is a middle and there is an end yes yeah. so the middle 
is the physical altercation, the shooting, the stabbing, the robbery, the the, the car bang, the, the the car accident, whatever it is. Yeah. The the you know the the the, the right right of bang is after things have after happened. The event. You know yeah. the consequences, the aftermath of violence. Uh, how to deal with the aftermath of violence, being short term or long term, be it uh, uh, you know it, it's going to reflect trauma, be it psychological, yeah. mental, emotional trauma, sexual trauma, physical trauma, uh, and how to go about with that. And like you said, how to articulate in a court of law to uh, avoid uh, getting in trouble for yeah. you know, for uh, defending yourself, basically. And yeah. And really what we spoke about and what we will, will, will really focus on today is the pre-fight confrontation. And by pre, we don't only mean just a second before, just a minute before, or just an hour before. Yeah. But what about a year before, two years before, three years before? How do we prepare ourselves to... Uh, be ready to avoid completely avoid an escape and to to spot behavioral red flags so that we can go huh this guy is a narcissist i don't want to uh, maybe i should remove myself and my family from his circle because i don't want people like that around me this guy is a psychopath he's all he's yeah. got all the traits of a psychopath i don't want me or my family around that person so we're gonna i'm gonna remove myself and my family or this guy is a sociopath or maybe this guy is a good guy having a bad day, but he's yeah. really pissed off today. And I, I don't want to be around that person right now because it's not safe for me and my family. So let, let, let's say, let's speak about the various disorder, personality disorders of people and how to recognize uh, behavioral red flags. Yeah. Well, just let me take a seat. Sure, sure, sure. Cheers. Yeah, so... You know, we, we look at subjects like that with people. So, like you're talking about the narcissist, the the uh, the, the, uh, the psychopath, and things like that. Yeah. See, that's another topic in itself, isn't it? It takes quite a lot of, of of looking into. So, you know, a lot of people are jumping on the bandwagon now with uh, well, a lot of these um, so-called, um, well, they call themselves combatants. I'd say sort of, I don't know what I'd call it, but they look at. Um, avoidance and awareness don't know how to be aware of your environment but that doesn't that doesn't cut it as such that's you know that's sort of yes you've got to be aware of your environment but you've also got to look at how people act how you know like you talk about somebody having a a, a good person having a bad day you know should you if somebody comes up to you and starts in your face for you stealing a car space say or nicking your shopping trolley or whatever Mm. do you have the right to stand there and, and smack him in the face well no you don't no. not only that it might be just a, a person who's just showing their aggression to you they've not had a chance to, to to let their aggression out to somebody else they might just project it to you yeah. so rather than giving them a smack in the mouth try and de-escalate so you've got to learn how to de-escalate the situation yeah. you know it might be a, the fact that a person's still coming forward to you but yeah. you still you still don't want to hit him, so you might give him a little attitude adjustment or something like that, mm -hmm. which is enough to put him on the back foot and say, "Okay, I'm sorry," you know, and walk away. So yeah. You've got to look at people's reactions, look at body language, yeah. and understand what person wants to fight you and what person doesn't. Yeah. So you could have somebody coming up to you, and they might be mouthing off to you, being really aggressively, ver verbally aggressive, but they're on the back foot. Yes. So you need to recognise they're on the back foot. They don't really want to fight. They're just yeah. being aggressive, and, and it's a defensive it's mechanism. Like, I think you and I had that on the doors many, many times. People, yeah, yeah. People, they're walking back while they're telling you, "I'm gonna fucking do yeah, it." Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Watch next time, and they're walking back, and you're like, "Dude, are you gonna do it from over there?" Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So there's there's lots and lots involved, you know. As a whole, like the way I run lessons, so if somebody comes to me and wants to do weekly classes or a workshop, so yeah. I talk about the subjects briefly. I might do a little 10, 15 minute slot on a certain subject, give them handouts or or sort of aim them towards my website where they can do online courses so they, they learn about the, the theoretical side because yeah. 
that takes so much time to learn the theoretical side yes. in comparison to the physical side. And it's too much to sort of stick into a lesson or a workshop. So you can briefly talk about them subjects to the extent where it's in there and I think, oh yeah, that makes sense. But they want to learn a bit more, so they need to get more in depth. So the way I do it, I'll, I'll run through a, a workshop or a lesson or a course. I'll give them these soft skills and I'll test them on those, you know, with some, I don't know, some questions and answers or whatever, just to yeah. see if it's it's sunk in there. Mm. Um, but like you say, you know, if, if, uh, observation and awareness for a lot of people just doesn't quit. That's just not enough to look to have as a self-protection system on top of a physical there's a whole load more that really needs to be looked at absolutely you know it's like when you when you think about the soft skills it's like the ability to recognize a, a, a potential threat something is off you know it's like uh using the using the ooda loop you know observation yeah, yeah. observation decision action using the uh the color code and all that but you know for example, the knowledge of understanding the selection process of yeah. a criminal, what criminals are looking for, what are their motivation, like for the fight, you know, either they're after your life, your body, or your belongings, or sometimes all three of them. Now, yeah. once you understand that, also what is to look for, so the the uh, what we call the the predatory optic, the optic through which the predator or the criminal views and selects his prey. Uh, all, all this, all this is very important. So, I always say, you know, it's like being a police officer. If you want to catch the criminal, you got to think like a criminal. And yeah. in terms of self-protection or protection in general, if you want to have the best chances to to get out of there alive and in one piece, you have to think. You have to know how the assailant, the criminal, uh, the predator thinks and um, you yes. know it's like sun tzu sun tzu said it you know know yourself know the enemy and always dictate the battleground so yeah and, and that's the thing when it comes to protection it's all about you know if you learn to think like a criminal then you can you can build a really good system in terms of yeah. the training that you do you can build realistic scenarios and um and you know you can ingrain that into the the trainees mind you know put it on the hard drive basically yeah um when when you speak about de-escalation tactics, now that's a big one, you know. Mm. When you look at when you look at, uh, not everybody speaks about de-escalation. You know, uh, most people just focus on the fighting. You do this, you do that. Uh, but when it comes to de-escalation tactics, what I see very very often, and what I have been taught in the past, is not de-escalation tactics. It's more like boundary setting. And there is a big difference between both. And most people don't understand that. That, uh, you know, saying to somebody, excuse me, excuse me, mate, could you hold it? Could you hold there, please? You're making me nervous. Or just stay there, please, mate. Or, you know, don't get any closer. Or just calm down, mate. That That is not. This is boundary setting, you know. Nobody's going to calm down if you tell them to calm down, especially if they yeah. got a problem with you, you know. Yeah. So basically, de-escalation tactics would be really making it about the person in front of you and not about you. Um, well, I always said that the best de-escalation tactics come from customer service. Because yeah. not only in customer service they want you to calm down, they also want you, they also want you to buy their shit. They want to yeah. sell you their shit. So they're gonna use the best, the best tricks in the book to calm you down and to emphasize em empathize with you and paraphrasing yeah. what you're saying and nodding nodding their head and smiling and so this would relate to de-escalation tactics what what have you got to say about de-escalation tactics the good way to de-escalate a, a, a potentially volatile situation and how how would you go about it well, I think you really you really touched on it there. You know, you know, you do conflict management in customer service based roles, yeah, um, or conflict resolution. But it's really aimed at, at against like an aggressive customer, which you could sort of you could work for somebody on the street, but it's slightly different. Um, Chris Roberts has done a, a great um, book, a, disarming conflict. He's done early conflict. Yeah, I need to. Yeah, so he, so yeah, so he's brought it up from from 
the workplace into the street um, and you know using different so it's all about really using empathy and active listening in order to control the situation it's like you just said you know if somebody's being aggressive to you you're not going to say you know calm down mate you know yeah. what i mean or, or, or i ain't listening to you you're talking shit now let me <laughs> talk that's not going to work is it so you've got to be active listen you know talk about it so okay mate um, i'm so sorry i'm so sorry that's happened can you explain what it is I, I don't understand what it is i've done do you know what i mean let him explain and sort of act, use active listening so sometimes it might be just somebody who wants to get the shit out you know what i mean just yeah, yeah. to be heard there's a lot of people out there they just use the mouth constantly and that's how they've got through life by being verbally aggressive mm. and for some people that's gotten through life you know so under so understanding how people can be aggressive why are they aggressive yeah how to deal with somebody being aggressive it's not always about smacking somebody in the mouth at the, for the first time they open their mouth yeah you know so some people might be suffering from ptsd you know mm. I, I had it not long ago i was walking through town in birmingham yeah and, and me and me and the missus were just laugh, laughing at each other about something we'd done in the day and this guy turned around and says what the fuck are you laughing at but he was covered in burns do you know what i mean so it was quite clear that this guy had got ptsd perhaps he'd been a, a soldier or something so rather than me react and saying "Fuck off mate i've nothing to do with you do you know what i mean you understand you say i'm so sorry my friend you know i was laughing with with the wife i wasn't laughing at you do you know what I mean? so it might be just somebody who's suffering with with some sort of anxiety some yeah. sort of mental health issues yeah so you've got to understand the differences in everything mm. Like put yourself basically in other people's shoes and go fuck yeah it. yeah yeah like yeah. feeling of like it's empathy but you yeah. know like empathy is difficult to access and i'm i mean i speak from experience I, i'm a very uh empath person do you know what i mean I've, i have always been since i was a kid i can i can sense people's energy it's actually quite scary yeah yeah, yeah. Lim limits uh psychic mate <laughs> yeah and, you know although i love people i love life i love animals I, i'm i'm the sort of person i'll never hurt anyone unless you know i'm capable yeah. of it and i've yeah. trained for many 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 years and i continue to train to be able to really hurt somebody or even take a life but i would you know it's not who i am like mm. you know, I'm, a, I'm a good person like yeah but when i when i'm thinking about somebody who is in my face uh, you know, being aggressive and talking some aggressive stuff, you know, all of a sudden you feel threatened because a person is in your personal space. You're automatically, you're asking yourself, whoa, what is he going to do? Is he going to hit me or is yeah, he yeah, sure. going to do that? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, I, I need to find the right middle. I like, I like to have that conversation because finding the just middle between, finding the perfect equilibrium between, de-escalation and emphasize emp empathize with the situation and you know having to preempt the guy because mm. he's in your personal space and you know i usually say if you're asking you if the guy is in your face and you're asking yourself if he's gonna hit you it's time to fucking hit him do you know what i mean yeah, or, yeah. so you're taking a risk uh, every time i said you're taking a risk by trying to de-escalate in some situations yeah certain situations yeah. yeah usually you can you can tell after doing the after doing a lot of training especially when you work i'm a big believer in doing um scenario replication training Me too, yeah. it's it's no good you know a lot there's some people who believe that um, stress testing involves sticking a broom handle style to your head and spinning around in a circle and then running to the aggressor that's not what it's all about if you're going to use scenario replication you need to trigger all of them senses i'm going to hear peace fall out can you hear me still yeah i can hear you yeah so you need to trigger all of those senses so your sight your smell your hearing yeah. So you, let's like let's say for instance you're going to do um, somebody assaulting you or trying to rob you at an ATM just just for instance yeah it's no good sticking a poster on the wall inside your training area and trying to replicate reality mm -hmm. I always tech people out 
well, well, first of all, contact the local police and say, we're going to be doing this training because nine times out of ten, you get somebody call them up and say, some guy's harassing somebody, it's an ATM. But you take them to the ATM, so you've got the sounds of the traffic, you've got the sounds of the birds, you've got people walking around, and it makes the whole situation more realistic. So I'll always teach people to look at look at what's happening around you, take it all in and think about that person. Is that person really going to rob you? Is that person really going to be aggressive towards you? Mm. And we'll work in different scenarios. So I might tell the person playing the attacker to attack the person playing the defender yeah. or maybe get them to just be aggressive to the person yeah, yeah. and not warrant any sort of attack. So for, through progressive scenario replication training, people are starting to understand people's body language more. Mm -hmm. So rather than you talk about it and hope that people are understand it, it's a massive leap from talking about it to replicating it. Yeah. Because, but, you know, when we talk about being preemptive, we've all got a right to preempt if we feel that our life is under threat. Yeah. You know, so I, if people are being aggressive to me, you know, what people say, you might get somebody say, oh, I'm not frightened of anything. I don't feel any sort of adrenaline at all anymore. We all feel it. Every yeah, single yeah. one of us feels it. No matter how many years we've trained, we'll always feel that feeling. It's just controlling it and understanding the aggressor, yeah. whether you should be preemptive, whether you should attack or de-escalate. Now, I always like to use, and a lot of people don't use it, is deception. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. 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 Decept de deception is a, is a fantastic tool yeah absolutely fantastic to catch a person unawares or to use deception in order to to divert their attention somewhere else and to, yeah. to de-escalate in that situation yeah yeah like, like, like pattern interruption yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah exactly. i agree with you i agree with you deception is a really good way and at the same time you know if you are if you're trying if you're truly trying to de-escalate the situation you you might be perceived to be weak by yeah. the person in front of you, which is perfectly fine because at that point, if you need to preempt them, they'll never fucking expect it because yeah. they, they think you're shitting it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. by by being oh mate, I'm really sorry, man. You know, I thought that the, you know, you, and you're just kind of trying to de-escalate the situation, and you got your hands obviously you know high enough to be able to to cover. Yeah, up yeah. What happens. Mm -hmm. And from there you can preempt really easily. So and, and makes your makes your initial response even more effective. Yeah, yeah. So that that's one thing. Like I mean, the uh, de-escalation tactics, verbal de-escalation tactics, very 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 important aspect yeah. of protection that most people uh, are not talking about enough. Yeah. You, you've, you've mentioned Chris Robert. Uh, I, I love Chris Robert. He's an amazing yeah. guy. You know, he's doing really, really good work. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I've, I've already learned a lot of stuff from him, and I will continue. Same with uh, Richard Dimitri. Great, great guys. Pamela Hermitage, really good guy within their uh, within their spheres as well. That yeah, I yeah. Are making a difference, just as yourself. So it's all about making a difference and helping yeah. people. Um, you know just completely avoid an escape like before you can even avoid an escape it's like so if if we speak about what we call behavioral awareness and mm. the ability to look at somebody and as you say read the body language but not only read their attitudes their words as as a whole to be able to uh, uh you know to make an informed decision in your head that uh yeah that guy doesn't look like a nice guy I need to move away from that person because nothing good is gonna is gonna come to, to from yeah. there. So, what would you say about like behavioral awareness, behavioral red flags, and stuff like that? What would you be looking for? Yeah, so I mean, like if you if you go back years when I was an idiot, you know, I'd never see these red flags and I'd ignore them and, and just go in for the fight anyway because I was a complete idiot. But, you know, like nowadays, as I've got older, you know, even if I walk into a pub and I don't feel the atmosphere is right, I'll walk out, that you know. It, yeah. So if going to a restaurant, 
Yes, I'm sure you're the same. I always want my back, you know, back towards the wall. Yeah. I want to be seeing everything going on around me. You know, just by having these sort of these little things up your sleeve and understanding, yeah. like we're talking about, you know, why do attackers attack? What are they looking for? And and looking at body language. So, for instance, you're you're in the pub here at the bar, and there's a, a guy staring at you. Yeah. What would be the point in staring back at him? You know, you just es you're escalating the situation. Yeah, yeah. So, understanding that, you know, some people you might think somebody might be staring at you, but they might be in deep thought. Or yeah, it's do you true. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So. It's understanding, like we talk about body language, which is a massive importance, and really using your gut instinct. Yeah, we've all got a gut instinct for one reason, and that's to, that's to enable to us to survive in 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 the world. If you feel that a situation isn't right, you just yeah. walk away. There's there's no right or wrong. It might be just total something silly. Yeah, you know, something might not come about. If you feel, listen to your gut instinct. And act upon it. A lot of the times, you will avoid situations. I, Absolutely. I, I call I call this the six the six sense the six yeah. sense yeah instinct stuff that yeah. the animals are the, the you know in the animal kingdom the animals are uh, are still connected they're still in tune with the universe with their instinct and all that but we as human beings we still have it but we're being taught not to believe in it not not to follow not to follow it and yeah you know, so i think like the, one of the best advice i give people is if your instinct tells you something you very often usually it's right and you need to listen to it so yeah. and even more than that i'd say that we should train it we should we should you know work it we should trust it so much that we can actually do like little games of uh you know like when you go in uh, you go hiking for example you know uh, i used to uh, like to get lost you know just just go somewhere and just get lost and just purely follow my instinct how obviously i got a tent with me and I i'll wild yeah. camp and stuff like that but i'll just go no compass no map i will just go purely from my instinct and what my instinct is telling me or you know some people they call it walking by faith yeah when people yeah. go on a spiritual pilgrimage a spiritual journey across different countries and they just walk they don't have a map they don't have a compass they just walk because they they listen to their heart they listen to where their heart is telling okay you're gonna take a left now i i don't know yeah. if you tried this bomb when I had my spiritual awakening, I used to love to, to do that. I used to go out and I used to just give myself direction, right? Now you're going to take a left. Okay, no yeah. problem. Okay, now you're going to continue straight. No problem. You're going to take the next right and the right after that. Okay. Yeah. And I, I'd, I'd find myself in some places where I would see stuff written on walls, very meaningful stuff written on walls. And I was like, shit, that is deep. Do you know what I mean? Because I... <laughs> I just walked by faith. I just followed my heart and walked. And I ended up meeting certain people. And I said to myself, I would have never met those people if I didn't do that. Or yeah. I would have never seen that nice graffiti on the wall that's got very deep spiritual meaning if I didn't do that. It's like, I think the instinct is, is something that shouldn't be underestimated and it should be worked, it should be developed. Um so I mean, I, I went a bit further now, you know, about kind of got yeah. out of our subject of conversation. But instinct uh, in, in self protection, like you call it, the gut instinct, is something you're going to feel. Uh, you know, most people before they got attacked, they they had a feeling. They just chose to ignore it. Yeah, you know? yeah. So instinct, very very important stuff. Um, so let's see now. What I'd like to speak about is, let's speak a bit about, there's a few things I'd like to speak about, all right? So yeah. the first thing would be the gang culture and and prevention. When it comes to violence prevention regarding gang life and gang grooming, what what do you have to say about this? What 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 should we actually speak about when it comes to all that? 
so you know we we think things like gang grooming so we might go into a school and talk about this but a lot of the times it's it's worthwhile having so we might go into school and talk about that but we'll have sort of um links for parents because it's the best for the parents to understand yeah you know look <clears throat> looking for signs that might um trigger that this your child is being groomed for gangs so you know just to see things like they suddenly got more money or they're getting money from nowhere mm -hmm. they might be turning up in brand new designer uh, trainers and, and and changing the way they're appearing with yeah. no money um, they might be using terms that are used in gangs, you know, gang talk, you know, yeah. little things like that, or, or or sort of being aggressive towards you suddenly, just tiny little triggers yeah. that can sort of make you understand that, hang on, this isn't right, yeah. and start looking deeper into it. So, you know, we, we do have, I had a, a headmaster from a local school approach me, um, well, probably about six months ago now, who said there's a young lad that um, is in the school. Um, he's a very quiet lad. He's only he only little for his age. Yeah. But his mum's worried because he's he's out till uh, two three o'clock in the morning. He'll he'll come yeah. home and he's and suddenly he's got a new pair of trousers or a nice new jacket and he she hasn't given him the money for it. Where's she getting it? Where's he getting it from? Yeah. And when when we sat and spoke to that person, you can start start to see that he's in fact being groomed yeah. by a local gang um because he's he's vulnerable so yeah. a lot of the times it's, it's it's to do you know kids haven't got they haven't got nothing to do they've got um if somebody's approached and say i'll give you 100 quid all you got to do mate is, is just deliver this little package down there on your on your little scooter go and do that and i think bloody hell 100 quid for doing nothing easy and that's yeah. how it starts just little things little things to look for yeah. um in the area where i live if i well what, what time is it now yeah about now if i was to go out now you'd see kids whizzing about on, on the electric scooters uh, they'll they'll go to somebody on the, one of the corners and you'll see them sort of take a package off them then they'll go off to a car and stuff through the window Do you know what i mean and, and these young kids i know that are really good kids and they come from good parents but they're just caught up in this in this world where there's nothing for them to do mm. so so we we'll, we may sort of act as a as a as a buddy to some of these people you know somebody as a uh, someone to look up to to follow around and give them some sort of help in going to a different avenue if you know what i mean yeah but the, there's a lot a lot of involvement and a lot of it is to do with not just one person dealing with it and not especially the police dealing with it because the police only look at things like that as a as a potential crime yeah. awaiting to happen or a crime to happen they're working with the police i'm going off on one a bit here now but working for the police i know that it's all point scoring for police and i'm sorry for all those coppers out there if there are good ones who do it for the love of it and to stop crime yeah, yeah. But i also know a lot of coppers that that do it they don't care about the people they care about their their um uh, whatever you call it performance i'd say yeah 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 so that's not all police as a whole, but I know a lot of people don't look at or what I'm saying. They don't look at the person as a person, as a good person. They don't look at where the family, you know, what the family's like. They don't look at that they come from a good home. Yeah. You need to look at why they've done that and address that. And we need to address it as 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 a whole community. It's no good one person trying to tackle that that subject. Yeah, everybody yeah. as a community needs to work towards it to, in order to stop these things from happening, and that's yeah. never going to happen if we don't all pull together. Yeah. So you know, like we, we're talking about, you do combatives of self protection and what have you, and the same as me. Some people might do martial arts, and some people might might do whatever. But we've all got that same intention. We've all got that same goal in mind, and that's to help other people. Mm. And, and we should all be working together, I, I believe, instead of, in our industry, 
there's a lot of backstabbing as we know there's a lot of people who don't agree with what you do there's some people comment well that's crap and and that's good mm. rather than being like that we all need to pull together because we all have got the same goal in mind yeah. all work together and we all learn from each other all of us learn something from each other so you know if you've got if you want to address something and you don't believe he's good speak to the person because it might be that person don't understand what they're actually talking about yeah, yeah. Do you know what i mean it's the same with any any sort so when we're looking at violence prevention if we're not all working together it's it, we're not going to get down to the root cause of it and, and get it solved i don't know yeah. if i've gone off on a tangent there mate I've just... <laughs> yeah i mean like when, when i'm thinking do you know we we're talking about gang gang grooming and stuff like that it's yeah. it's stuff that i had i i experienced that firsthand when i was younger you know I've, i have been involved with gangs unfortunately when i was younger and yeah. It's always this, uh, like you said, there is that that person you're looking up to, that you know, like the alpha male of the of the group that's done this and done that, and you know, you think it's it's cool, and you want to go down the same path, and you got this initiation where, yeah. in order to be part of the gang, you got to do that, you got to bid someone up, you know. You gotta yeah. bit somebody up to the inch of their of their life or their death, or do you know what I mean? Or you gotta rub someone, or you you gotta do something. Yeah, and you start getting into this this vicious circle that never that never ends because by doing stuff you're pissing people off, so you create yeah. enemies, and you know, and, and so it's constantly fighting. So you're constantly fighting with somebody. And yes, you'll bid somebody up, but then you know his friends and the big brothers and whatever is gonna is gonna get somebody else, and it's like a war, man. It's not like yeah. a war; it is a fucking full full blown war, you know. Yeah, yeah. Where yeah, absolutely, there, there are always these repercussions, and it never stops. It never stops yeah. because you know everyone wants to have the last word, and the mm. truth is that people die, people go to prison. People yeah. uh, get hospitalized. People get, um, how do you call that, uh, paralyzed. Or, you know, some people, they, they have, it, it just impacts their life in, in, in very, very heavy ways. So mm. it's never worth it, the gang, the gang life. But, you know, like I said, you know, for, the, for those that are lucky, those of us that are lucky that we kind of reverse you know, reverse the our, our life at the right moment. Because I'm saying to myself, you know, if I didn't reverse my life at a certain point of my life, I wouldn't be, we wouldn't be having that conversation. Yeah, yeah. By all counts, sometimes I'm asking myself how, you know, it's, it's a fucking miracle I'm still here. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So. But it, I mean, that can happen on the same end of the, the, the different side of the coin as well, can't it? You know, working in, working in certain industries, you know, like we talk about working on the doors. Yeah. You can turn into that animal. Oh yeah. Quite easily. Of course. You know, if you don't know how to control yourself and you and you keep that all that aggression pent up and you're involved in that situation all the time, you will become that person. Yeah. So it's the same, it's the same thing, isn't it? When you it's just it's a, a massive circle, the same as with gangs. You yeah. you get involved in that life and that's just part of your life, the same as anything. Do, do you know what? I, I was having that chat with a few people recently and realized here in Manchester, you know, Manchester has got a big crime history and a big like gang history back in the 90s and to people yeah, used to yeah. get shot and stabbed. Uh, when you look at Moss Side and you look at all, all these, these Side, places, yeah. even Stockport here where I am, it used to be bad. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was, I was talking about that, the fact that, you know, most of the fighters high level martial artist fighters like thai boxers or boxers or mma fighters people that are now coaching yeah some of the top people in manchester actually you know you realize that everybody knew each other it's a small manchester is a small yeah. place it's a small world where back in the days the doorman used to be either fighters or gangsters and sometimes all three do you know yeah, what I mean? yeah. And and so 
it's only obviously when they when they introduced the the SIA badge that you know that was really to weed out the 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 people, the criminal, the sexual predators, the, the yeah, gangs, yeah. drug dealers. Because you had a lot of people working the doors. Uh, I know for a fact that there was people that used to love working the doors just so they could fucking beat people up. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, the the way the way it used to work when I did it to start with, what we call old school, mm. you'd either be offered a job by the local doorman after seeing you have a fight, or you'd have a reputation for fighting. They'd offer you a job, and the first thing they ever asked you if you go up and say, "We've got any work, mate?" They'd say, "Can you scrap?" That was yeah. it. That was it. Yeah. And if you was good, you get the job. That's that's the way they used to work. Yeah. So introducing the SIA, SIA, like you say, it's got it's weeded out a lot of the crap. But and I'm sorry if I upset anybody, but it also brings people into the business that shouldn't be in the business oh, as well. Absolutely, hundred percent. That's a trouble. Hundred yeah. percent. I, uh, yeah. I I I told you I started working the doors in Lithuania in Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the stuff that we used to do over there, and I'm talking 2003 to 2005, yeah, so a good while ago, uh, mate, we we would we would get arrested, we would get jailed, lose our license, arrested for for things like that in here. Uh, yeah. Just used to knock people out every Friday. Yeah, yeah. Friday. that was just yeah. that was just normal. You know what I mean? Yeah. And we get had, in the broom cupboard. Yeah. <laughs> And we had, oh, yeah, we had telescopic batons and CS sprays and stuff like that as part of security. We had a, yeah. we had a room downstairs, a place I used to work at that was called the Fashion, Fashion Club, yeah? yeah. We used to have what we used to call the torture room downstairs. <laughs> yeah. Bloody hell, yeah. And we had the people that were all the time, so there was the suited and booted people at the entrance and inside the club, and then there was the people in red T-shirts. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, mate, it, it was just madness. But when you think about it now, now, uh, because I do I do provide training for the security industry as well, like for yeah, you know, same here, yeah. security operatives and stuff. And I said to people, it's like, right now, if you want to be a good security operative, a, a good doorman, the most important thing that you need to work on is your customer service, your your communication skills, your active listening skills, and your appearance. If yeah. you if you have these things, you have more. You have pretty much everything that you need. Now, of course, on the top, you need to be able to look after yourself. And I wouldn't even call that scrap. You need to be able to uh, work uh, on your own or as part of a of a two man team or three man team, and being able to control and restrain. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. really what it is. And in the event of the worst case scenario, then yeah, you got to be able to put your hands up and start, you know, start fighting. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that this comes with a certain type of mindset. Not everyone has got the mindset to do that that type of work. And I, you know, it yourself. Yeah. I've had people in here in England uh, that I was working with, like some agency people. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I was fucking hell, you got no business being here, man. Yeah, like, yeah. You know what we used to do in Lithuania when people used to hide? Some of our colleagues used to hide when there was a big scrap. They were getting it, mate. They yeah, yeah, absolutely. It. They, were thrown, they were thrown off the doors. They were not working there again, not working with anyone else, and they would get a beating from us. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so that you know, that's 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 different, mate. Like this, the, how things work in this country, like you said, some people have got no business doing that. Type no. of work. I mean, that, that that was one of. The, I mean, I used to teach for for the SIA for uh, upcoming doorman and that, but yeah, I stopped doing it purely because of what they were sending through the doors. You know, they were they were like um, the the government do an incentive where these they pay you to put these people through one of the courses and they turn up and you think what what are you doing here do you know what i mean they'd say yeah. oh i want to become a doorman and you just you know even working for the police i had a, a one situation i'm just taking this one situation i was i was in the front office the one day in in the city center in birmingham and i got the these uh, travelers in in the front office uh, and they were they've got a good reputation in birmingham these travelers and they was they was kicking off 
so because i couldn't leave leave the desk at the time i called for this one officer to come down and deal with them and he stood behind the counter and i was sat behind him i could just see this guy this policeman's legs just doing that shaking all over the place and i looked at him and he just completely lost all his color and i says are you okay and he says i, I can't deal with this he says i don't know what to do so i says okay you have a sit down and i'll deal with it yeah so you, you go out there and knowing how to deal with people um you know got these two two guys there but it's like this police officer i thought well, what are you doing in, in this prisons. job yeah, yeah, if yeah. you can't handle that that situation and it's yeah. not not always down to that person sometimes it's down to the training you know i mean i don't know if you know but the the police in my eyes are, are so inadequately trained it's ridiculous yeah you I, know so it's it's the same on the door you know you 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 might have a situation kick off and you've got some one guy behind you cowering in the corner who just don't want to get involved or suddenly they disappear and, and at the end of the situation say so what happened I, I was in the toilet i was i yeah, weren't yeah. feeling very well yeah you know what i mean you need to go mate no is it man <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah let's let's just uh let, let's just go for another 10 minutes yeah and yeah. i was thinking so because we uh it, it's good man. I, like, I like when the conversation flows mate. yeah yeah we're going off on a tangent in way so, so what about what we call sexual grooming okay yeah so yeah. if we talk about uh, child sex, sexual abuse and uh, you know any any type of sexual abuse because you know child sexual abuse is one thing uh, women is one thing and it also happens to men you know yeah, so yeah. what do you think are the points that need to be spoke you know spoke on when it comes to all that stuff spoken about well, the first thing is, is who you're speaking to, who, who you're talking to about it, you know. Yeah. It's not something, a lot of the times, it's not something you could go into a school and talk about. Yeah. You could talk about, you could put yourself in a position where if they've got problems, that you, your, your ears are open for them to come and sit and listen to, you know, listen to them. Um, it's quite a, it's quite a, an untalked about subject yeah. and who you're going to teach it to so obviously i've got it all on my website for people to do a course just in that alone um so you're understanding again like we was talking about gangs what to look out for because it might not be that child might not be sexually abused under your roof they yeah. could be staying at a friend's house of a weekend being sexually abused by their parents or even the friend you know it doesn't so it's understanding the signs and and you, you, there's never it's never a wrong thing to suspect somebody may be sexually be being sexually abused yeah there's not a right and wrong if you have that feeling and you see those signs that something isn't quite right and you've got that feeling that may be sexually abused you know although we, we, we hear of horror stories where people have been accused of something which they haven't done you need to understand the signs that this child or this person may be going through sexual abuse yeah. and understanding that and when we talk about running classes you know I, I don't know about yourself but I've had lots of people come to me who have never talked about any sort of abuse that they've gone through in their life yeah yeah because I don't want people to know mm. but you can see that something isn't right so if you brought somebody into so if you've got somebody in front of you you start talking about sexual abuse you know even though you're trying to portray it as a subject you want people to learn you've got to understand that some people don't report these abuses yeah and you may be triggering some sort of trauma again so you know that's when we when we start talking about being in, in trauma informed uh, okay. self protection or self defense teachers but when we look at trauma being trauma informed doesn't make you a trauma specialist that's mm -hmm. a lot what a lot of people misunderstand 
you know, to, to become a trauma specialist, you, you need to be doing like degrees and stuff like that and, and continual development and, and working in that environment constantly. So, you know, working with sexual abuse, it's quite an in-depth and tricky subject to talk about. Yeah. So if somebody wants to learn about sexual abuse from me, I give them that option of either sitting down and talking to me or doing an online course or mm. or looking at what I've wrote about. Do you know what I mean? Because it's like any sort of trauma. People don't want to talk to you about it. Mm. So it's quite a difficult subject. So again, going off on the tangents again. So it's looking for signs, understanding the signs that somebody could be could be experiencing sexual abuse. Yeah. But like that's a that's a massive subject in itself. So we, we could be yeah. sitting here for ages talking about that. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, all, all stuff that happened to people. And uh, as you said, I mean, just, just to kind of close up on the on the sexual abuse subject is yeah. that very often this comes from a member of the family or a close friend or somebody like a teacher or somebody in their direct environment, yeah. which is, is fucking scary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, so I, I know, for example, I have a friend yeah, who's got a, who's got a kid, a little girl, and uh, he's got, um, how do you call that? A, a, a nana that, that takes care of her. Yeah. Because yeah. He, and he says to me, I, I do not trust anyone with my kids. And it was very difficult to find somebody that I could trust. But he still, even though he trusts her, he's got, he, he's got like um, cameras in teddy bears. He's got all sorts of oh, things. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's got the, the whole, he's got his whole house is cammed up, you know. So he's like, you know, that 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 could be one uh, precaution, you know. But I've seen some, I've seen some really disturbing footages uh, from from that type of cam that were hidden inside the house of some uh, carers, you know, some some uh, some adults that are going to look after young children and just slapping them or just dropping them or just uh, kind of traumatizing them in some ways, and. You know, it could be that the parents would never know about it if it wasn't mm. for that camera. Parents would, because those kids, they're so young that they can't even voice their, their yeah. you know, they're just taking the trauma, they're soaking into that trauma, and it will follow them all their life. Yeah, there's exactly. Nothing, there's nothing they can do. It's like, you know, when, when, when people are vulnerable, and that's where we speak about kids. Young kids are vulnerable. They don't have the emotional intelligence to voice things and to go and speak to daddy or mommy or anyone. And they just don't have the voice. They don't have a voice. They're too young to have a voice to be able to voice their concern and what's happening. Yeah. So I think this is one very, very scary stuff. And, and it is. And like you say, a lot of the times it's, it's done through people that they know or some yeah. people are in positions you know yeah. whether it whether it be something for a church from the church somebody be a teacher whether it be a friend or a friend's parents you know what i mean it can be yeah. anybody and and you know what the scariest thing is that you hear of cases where you know the perpetrators are people that are in a position of trust like you said like a priest like yeah. a, like a doctor like a teacher like a, a member of the family People yeah. that you you know you you'd say nah that's nah he would never do anything like that and, yeah. and you know and then things like that happen and you're like fuck you know it's like I've heard um, in here in Manchester I've, I'm not going to mention the name but I've heard uh, like a, a martial arts instructor I believe that he used to teach Muay Thai and he was a quite popular guy everybody knew about yeah. him you know yeah. and a, and a good teacher as well you know a good coach. <laughs> Uh, yeah. been a high level fighter uh, before, and apparently, he was uh, you know, he was sexually abusing kids. Yeah, well, we're, we're talking about martial artists, so I'm not mentioning names, but mm. you, 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 I'm sure you know, there was there was two in particular, um, uh, where the the, the, the wife was grooming the kids, okay, taking, taking them back to, I'll send you a link to this in case you didn't know, sending them back to, uh, to the husband who was also a martial arts teacher and they were sexually both sexually abusing the kids 
Now it turns out that the the, the wife was actually groomed by yeah. the husband back when she used to be a student under him. So she's learned she's learned this process, and she believed that obviously it's just a normal thing to happen. Yeah. So it, it was quite a high profile um, story. So I'm not going to talk too much about it, but I'll send it you to to the link to yeah, read. So you'll be uh, uh, yeah, quite high profile. So it can happen. It can happen, especially you know in in, in clubs and stuff like that, and it happens all the time. Yeah, that that is that is scary stuff, man. And I think that you know if there was anything for for parents to learn how to spot the behavioral red uh, red flags uh yes. from from those people and you know i mean it's it's something that's very difficult to do how will you know that your grandfather is is sexually assaulting your your daughter exactly and that happens and that, and that, happens. And that leads you also to think if the grandfather is is assaulting her in a sexual way He's an old guy now. How how long has he fucking been doing that? And who has he abused before? Yeah. You know? so that's a frightening thing, isn't it? You know, it's it's, it's like you say, you you've got to you got to understand the signs, you know, for you for you to see. And and by you know, as silly as it sounds, let's let's talk about uh what should I say? Apathy and denial. Let's go back to that. Let's look at people who, for instance, advertises the children on on facebook yeah i'm not saying there's anything wrong with it you know we all want to share how lovely our kids are you know what i mean it's there's nothing wrong in that but unfortunately we've got predators out there that look for these things so you might you know it's okay advertising your child but you and you're advertising the child's name you you're taking pictures of them with the school uniform on and unfortunately there's, there's predators out there that prey on these type of posts that people mm. put out. Mm. Uh, you know what I mean? So it could be something from from that. You know, it might might be not very often, but it might be a stranger approaching your child who's got you know sort of grooming them outside of the environment. But yeah. like, I, like you say, nine times out of ten, it's somebody that they do know. It doesn't mean that they know them directly. It might be somebody that they see out in the street, you know, and get to know them that way. So, so looking for the signs, it's, it's a big thing. Yeah. So what, what what's your take on, uh, you know, people posting pictures of their kids on social media? Do you think that's something that should be avoided? Or is there actually a, you know, let's say you're a father and you just want to have a picture of you and your and your daughter on uh, your Facebook profile is is that something that you think should be done or is it or is it risky or what no no not risky at all it's something that you know we've all got the right to do that and I'm not saying yeah. there's nothing wrong with it but it's just understanding what you've got like you're talking back talking about you need to be in the the attacker's mind to understand how an attacker works yeah you need to get into the mind of of, of these predators and what they look for so try not to mention your child's name mm -hmm. or, or you know and and certainly if if they've got something on advertising their school blur it out all the yeah. time yeah you know what i mean yeah, and, and it's like that's yeah it could sorry mate because because your children at a young age they haven't got the they haven't got the responsibility saying yes can, please put the picture of me on facebook they've got no say in it and it might be something that they don't want you to do mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? they might not want their picture put in on so you've got to understand all these little little bits there's nothing wrong in it you know i post pictures of my son on on facebook there's nothing wrong in it mm. but you've got to understand what may be being looked at by predators yeah. don't give them any clues to where these people are where your kids are yeah. don't give them clues to what their name is just in case they approach them mm -hmm. obviously you've got friends and family who, who know that person that you're picture you're putting on and they may mention the name but that's just a risk you've got to take so do i believe it's wrong no mm. but you just need to understand that there are people out there that look for these yeah. things 
So it's no good being apathetic to the world. That it's like being apathetic to violence is never going to approach you. Yeah, you know it could happen, and then we fall into the old denial thing. Then you know, yeah. so it, you just just understand how predators work. The same as yeah. how, as, how as, um, people who assault you work. Mm -hmm. Okay, that look really really good chat i think that we should do that again at some point when we get a, a bit more time perhaps in the next couple of weeks uh and yeah. then we can speak about uh putting something up together in june for people okay like a seminar uh we'll, we'll have a chat we'll have a chat about all this uh for yeah. now we'll just we'll just wrap it up i think that you got a, a session to go to and I, I need to go and meet someone uh yeah. good guy uh Pan panikos yusuf you know panikos yeah, yeah, yeah. Panikos. Yeah, I've heard of him. I don't know him personally, but yeah, I've heard of him. One of my best friends. I'm going to his house now. Um, yeah. So um, it was amazing to talk to you. Daz, we'll definitely do that at some point soon. And uh, do you want just quickly before we go um, to tell us where we can find you, where we can find your work? I believe you got some courses on your website. What, where, where do we find you if people want to uh, buy your courses or things like that? Yeah, so if you go onto my website, which is uh, www.fendo, F-E-N-D-O, dot UK, not co dot, just dot UK. And on there, you'll, the, the, there's articles which are quite interesting. Um, I've got courses on there if you wanted to take a, an in-depth course, which are very cheap. But it's, there's a lot of information in there which, which could help you or anybody especially if they're teaching self-protection, giving them some subject matter to, to teach to their students. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of things on there. Um, it's full of all sorts of information, but you'll see it on there. And I'm also on Facebook and Instagram where I post everything on there. So again, it's fendo.uk. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, uh, so if you go on the website, you'll see on the top courses, articles, just drop in there and there's, there's all sorts of things there. So you can either sign up for newsletters and everything. Nice one. Nice one, Daz. Well, thank you very much for your time, man. And uh, let's link up at some point soon, brother. Absolutely. Yeah, right. nice talking to you, mate. So for anyone that wants to uh, have a look at this podcast again or you want to share it, uh, you can find it on my YouTube channel, which is Adrenaline Combatives, in the live section. Uh, don't be shy. Share it. Spread the love. And uh, we will speak to you soon, guys. Take care. Cheers.